Welcome to our presentation on how to implement a music technology unit in upper elementary school. My name is Victor, I'm from the University of Miami. And my name is Josh Rodriguez, and I am the music teacher at Stewart Elementary in Miami, Florida. All right, so one of the problems that might arise when trying to do a music technology unit, unit is wondering, you know, what gear do I need? That is definitely one of the problems in terms of access, as you, you always will need some type of gear to do music technology, as opposed to like, if we want to sing, we just sing, we just need our voices. But with music technology, you definitely need some gear, but it doesn't have to get be that fancy gear that um, you might think you need. You can always work with whatever you have. You know, uh, most students have uh, smartphones, that can be a great starting point. If they have tablets, if you have tablets at school or laptops, even if you have one laptop, that could be a start on implementing some introduction to music technology in your elementary school program. Within the hardware that you may have, there are many apps that you can use, uh, some free apps um, that are useful for laptops, for example, you can download Audacity. Uh, GarageBand comes built in with most Apple um, devices, be that iPads or iPhones, and also on uh, the computers. Soundtrap, BandLab, these are all things that you could download and use for free, although um, premium versions are available as well. And there are other many apps or software or DOS digital audio workstations that are paid and that have a lot of features like Ableton and many others that you can find um, just by doing a quick search as well. Now, how do we go acquiring some of these equipments that we've been talking about? First thing is try and involve your administration. Schedule a meeting with them or email them. And you'd be surprised sometimes. Sometimes they, they have the money and the budget to maybe give you some of it to purchase some of this equipment. And even in those times where they don't, because especially right now, money is something that is very tight right now. Involving them and just letting them know what you're doing, what you're planning on doing, goes a long way as far as your relationships with them. Donors choose as well. You can put your project on Donors Choose and you don't even have to put a whole class set. You can do something with six laptops, seven laptops, any number. You don't have to have a full 20 set. Putting on donors' shoes, there will definitely be people that will contribute to your project. Applying for grants and also connecting with your local universities. Some of them have music outreach programs. A lot of them probably already have maybe music education programs that teach you for the students. Reaching out to them, seeing if they can help. Because the universities are always looking to be involved with their, with their local schools and giving back. So that is definitely one source you should be looking at if you haven't already. Yeah, that's a great point because that's, you know, how uh, Josh and I met was through the University of Miami Out Outreach Program. And in our case, um, the outreach program was generous enough to help us with, for example, obtaining the licenses, um, for the computers and also providing um, some guidance on how to implement some of these projects. So it's definitely a good source if you need um, some additional help in getting started. And as far as not having those class sets that we talked about, that is very much, you can use a way to work around that. If you're, let's say, most you have is maybe seven iPads or maybe just six laptops, divide the groups. They take turns on when they're working on the equipment. And whatever they're, whenever they're not on those laptops, you're having them do prep work so that when they go to laptops, they're ready. So if you're doing something like lyric writing, which we'll get into a little bit later, they're working on their lyrics away from the laptops. And then once they go on, they do it with the music and making the music that they selected. So there's different ways to work around it. 
don't let that be the reason why you don't want to try this or you don't want to get involved with music technology. There is always a workaround. Um, if you're not comfortable maybe doing group work, it's a good moment to try to also uh, change up a little bit of your teaching style and rely a little bit more on collaboration and students helping each other and um, you know, a larger group trying to work together in one equipment, learning to share. So there are many uh, pedagogical alternatives also if you don't have enough gear for everyone to, to work individually. Now, a good way to start also if you're not fully comfortable with music technology is blending whatever you're already doing in general music, in a general music setting and using some of the technology to enhance or to bring a different light to the general music work. So if you're singing, if you're drumming, if you're doing um, different types of, of general music activities, you can always just start very simple by recording them or you know, by using um, some gear and students record that. So that's a, that's a great way to begin uh, music technology process. And we will show later how this could be implemented in a full uh, lesson. But those are some ideas that might start uh, get you to think about how you can blend your approach with a general music, with a music technology uh, element. Um, we use some of the e equipment and then students recorded uh, different sounds from the room. Uh, they recorded, the, they created their own melodies. They recorded their own singing. Even when the cases when they were free to record whatever they wanted, a lot of them gravitated towards singing tunes they already knew. Some of the ideas that we did that we incorporated is the, like Victor said, they would record some of the songs we were working on, maybe some melodies that they knew, or they would do their own patterns on different body percussion, on different uh, percussion instruments they recorded. And then we would get those sound files, import them, and then make a completely new song using all the sounds that they recorded and use it in Audacity and different programs. So that's one way that we can use some of those recordings to creatively make something completely new out of it. This really emphasizes a student's creativity. Uh, if you can play experiment with different sounds, you know, altering whatever original sound you had and making it sound different, seeing what that makes you feel, what that makes you uh, think, but also on the teacher's creativity. So it really, pushes you to start thinking about how to do things differently, how you can, you know, alter something that wasn't there before through um, the available resources that you might have. And one final way that we can um, use or blend general music, which we found was very helpful when we got into very intense music technology or like a very technical music technology um, phase throughout the unit was to bring in a surprise general music session. So we saw, for example, that after a few music technology sessions, some of the students were starting to get strained a little bit because we were emphasizing a lot of uh, technical elements and it was very hard for some students. And bringing in um, a general music session in between the unit brought a different light. It sort of reinvigorated students back into singing, back into doing some traditional music making. And then when they went back to the music technology, they were all uh, motivated again to start working that again. Yeah, it really helped reinvigorate them and just give them a break. Whenever we're doing these these kind of these projects, this kind of project-based learning, and you're building up to something, it can get very strenuous sometimes. And it's, and especially when you keep repeating a lot of the things, it can you know wear you down a little bit. So for the students, having that session where we just took a break from music technology and we just kept it as a pure general music session, uh, really helped them so that when we came back. The, pre the next week and worked on that music technology again to kind of refocus them. And, you know, they were rekindling again after taking a break to 
go back into it and pick up what we left off. So it's about finding the right balance between both approaches. And like we said, you know, it's good to establish a routine, but sometimes building a routine can, can also get a little bit monotonous. So changing it up, um, bringing that surprise element usually helps with engagement as well. Now with music technology, undoubtedly we have uh, an intrinsic connection with popular music. If you're not comfortable or if you don't know about popular music and you're not sure how to start implementing it, well, you know, the first thing is uh, the why. Why bring it into school? And it really is a way to connect with students' realities, with students' music preferences, and also help with the motivation about music in general, and especially about music class in school. So one way to do it, you know, it's how help students select their own repertoire, learn from that. Because like we mentioned, that brings their whole world into school. Sometimes students are listening the whole day outside of school to their music. And then when they come to school, none of that music is valued. And so they feel a, a, a large disconnect between music at school and what they think is music for them. So it's a good way to, to balance that. And it goes you know, into cultural, you know, cultural relevance. You know, what's, what's meaningful to the students? And like Victor said, how powerful would it be to have the music that they're listening to at home and in their, at their houses with their parents in the music class, how legitimizing it is and how more interesting it will all be for them once they make that connection from outside of school inside the music classroom. Yeah, and it's really hard to know what's popular because interests shift really fast nowadays. And what was popular for your fifth grade was not going to be popular for the fifth grade next year. So we cannot always rely on what we thought was popular. Even if you do a Google search and go, okay, what's, you know, what's popular now? If you get like a billboard list or something like that, you, that might not be the music that your school population is listening to. So it's important to ask them, you know, you can conduct some type of um, surveys using Google Forms, or even some inf just informally asking them and then writing it down. So what, you know, or asking them to show you on their smartphones, okay, show me something that you listen to and then writing down that name so that you know what type of music they're listening to, that you can learn about it. And then you can also help them relate to it in a healthier way sometimes. So it really, it's about knowing your school population, knowing the community that you are in and the type of music that they are listening to, their musical influences, their culture. So that's a, those are some of the elements that knowing about their music can help you learn also and develop in terms of your school. And also that helps you build rapport with your students. And also, like Victor said, popular music is changing all the time. And this isn't just something you have to do once. Okay, you're always gonna have to keep updated and keep asking your students. They're gonna see that you have a vested interest in them and keeping things relevant for them. And they'll be more than happy to talk about what their, what their music is. And again, it just garners more interest and gets them more excited for what you're about to do with them in the classroom. We have to be flexible. It's hard though sometimes because we might not like <laughs> the music that they're listening to, but, and then they might not like the music that we like. So, we have to be open in that regard and learn from them, but also we can uh, help them learn what is it that we like, how we feel about our music, how we feel about their music. And so we empower them in that way also. And we, be, we share authentically what our interests are as well. And we can pose a critique on their music and they can pose a critique on our music because most likely it won't be, we might not be sharing the same musical interests that doesn't mean that we're the only ones with valid music interests. They uh, know a lot about music that we have no idea many times. So yeah, that's what brings the honesty also in the relationship with students. So what are some of the things then that we can do to incorporate some of these things 
this popular music and the music technology into actually doing something with it. One of the things is having the students recreate their favorite songs. So when we're using maybe something like Soundtrap, BandLab, or Audacity, getting different loops, getting different sound clips, and having them try and make that really popular radio song hit that they've always been listening to. Another great way is to do a parody writing of it. Downloading the backing tracks of their favorite song, whatever that might be, and then saying, okay, let's recreate the lyrics, replacing certain words to make a parody out of it, right? So a parody is something silly, right? It's supposed to be something funny on the take of the original song. Those work really, really well. Also just coming up with completely new sets of lyrics, something like rapping, getting a, a, creating a complete new instrumental track with drums, guitar, piano, synth, and having the kids create their own lyrics on top of that. And this is a little bit of a challenge sometimes because students are very scared to vocalize and to sing. They're very self-conscious sometimes in a classroom. So they don't have to necessarily sing whatever they're writing. They could very easily read it aloud. They don't even have to wrap it in rhythm. The whole point of this is to have the students do something creatively. So whatever that might look for them, empower them. If they can only read through it, have them read through it. If not, they wrap the lyrics that they wrote. And if they want to add some singing to them, have them sing on top of it, right? Let them express their, express their creativity. And obviously using the backing tracks when we're doing all this. And this could be something that you download off of the internet, or it could be something that you want to create with your students. Maybe you want to have different instrumental components. Maybe you want to require them to have certain instruments, or maybe you want to have them use a certain pattern in their drums. There are many possibilities to take with the backing tracks. So it's really up to you whether you want to download something or you want to create something with your students and then they do their lyrics on top of that. The possibilities are endless here. Yeah, you will find a lot of students who already have a lot of their favorite backing tracks selected, which they use to wrap on top of. Or uh, like, like Joshua said, they can develop their own backing tracks uh, using loops in some of the software that we mentioned and then using those loops to, at the more basic level, even read on top of it. Because once they start using their voice connected with a backing track, with the music, then they become more comfortable vocalizing with a musical background. And that can lead to then speaking on rhythm, which can lead to rapping, and then that can lead to a more sophisticated way of melodic singing. So it's a great, good way to start. Now, not every student is at the same level or will develop at the same pace. So it's important also to be aware on how we could uh, differentiate a little bit some of the lesson plans that we can create. Some of the ways is keeping the same goal for all the students, a broad goal, you know, develop their musicianship or being expressive or create something. But then at the more specific levels, the objectives can be different. So for some of them might be, you know, using the software to do a backing track and to record on top, while for some others might be just singing on top of a already preset backing track from off of the internet. So it's two different skill levels, but they're both then uh, creating something and expressing themselves. So that's what we mean by keeping the same broad goals, but then maybe doing very different objectives. And remembering as well that it's, we want to challenge our students absolutely, but we also want them to have a measure of success and achieve something. So if something is too far out and there's something is really struggling with, it's okay to scale it back. As long as it's still challenging and pushing them, that's the most important part. And I dare say, as long as they're being creative and they're, and they're creating something and they're taking ownership over it, that's really all that matters. And it goes back to what is that goal? Is the goal creativity or is the focus more on technicality? That's gonna be up to you to decide. But whatever it is, make sure we know it. And then with that, you can change your objectives as you see fit. Yeah, and observe the students. Because, you know, we might, we might uh, miss our target. We might think, yeah, the students will be able to do all this. But then we go and we try to implement that lesson. And 
you know, not all of them are, and that can create some frustrations. And you know what? It's, it's okay to not adapt on time. Sometimes that is very hard. It requires a lot of also skill to adapt immediately and change the lesson as you go. But if, if that doesn't happen, just make sure that you had observed what happened and then that you're able to adapt for the next lesson. So if you weren't able to adapt on that time, make sure that you are able to adapt on the next one because for that, then there's no excuse. A way to do that is to analyze your lesson plan. You, you know, you craft your general lesson plan and then you can find alternatives to some of your, you know, the, the main, le- main activities that you thought about and then thinking about ways to create alternatives to those, but trying to get at the same things. We all know that not every class is the same. It's every person, every student is a unique learner, has a different sets of challenges and different strengths. And it's just knowing who are the classes that we know are probably gonna struggle a little more with this and how can we adapt the lesson or make a few changes here and there to make sure that they're still being challenged but that they're still enjoying it and not being overwhelmed so much the technical side of it. That's something that's a very easy trap to fall into when we're doing the music tech side. We want to focus on that, yes, but it, depending on what your goal is, it doesn't have to be all about that. So just remember to know which classes are struggling, make those adjustments so that it's still an enjoyable and fruitful music experience for them. Now, with a lot of music technology work, you might not be required to develop precise movements like you might need for, you know, to learn the guitar, for example, or to learn to play the piano. But you might end up relying heavily on learning procedures, on, you know, memorizing certain routes so that you can load tracks and, you know, know where things are on the software. But that might leave the students, their feelings out of the picture. In order to find a balance with that, it's important to create explicit, effective objectives. Now, a way to do that is aiming at these three levels. So making sure you develop an objective that helps students be ready to do something, you know, so that's at at the receiving level, you know, that they're ready to receive instruction. So maybe helping them become aware of something, you know, maybe just one lesson, you just want them to become aware that they can download tracks uh, out of YouTube because then they're ready to do it. And then you might leave the actual download for the next lesson. Another alternative is developing objectives for them to become ready to respond. That is, they want to do it. And a way to do that is, is to really find, for example, a satisfaction so that students like what they're doing. If they don't like uh, how you're approaching things, then you will have a hard time for them wanting to do it on their own. And that might drift them away from music or from music technology. Ideally, you want to get at a place where they value it so much, where they make everything that they're doing their own. You're going to see that some of your students are going to download some of these programs on their own and that they're going to start making their own beats, making their own music after when they're not in the music classroom. And that's really what what we're trying to instill and foster, right? It's that creative process. It's that eagerness. It's that interest in it. And and that's what it really all starts with, right? If they're not excited about what they're doing, it's going to be very difficult to go on that journey with them to take them where you, well, where you want them to go. Are already very tech savvy. We got to remember our kids are growing up in a very different time from when we went to school. They're bathing in this, in this technology. Some of them have their own tech at home and they'll ask you to bring it in. By all means, have them bring it in. Let them you know, bring their knowledge and what they have to be a part of the classroom. And sometimes they'll also ask to bring in some of the music that they worked on as well. Your students are a reservoir of knowledge. Let them bring in what they value into the classroom. You'd be very surprised what some of them have and what some of them know how to do. Some of them know how to do so many things already. 
Yeah, and even if their gear, if they bring gear that doesn't work, it's a good learning opportunity because they might bring a mic that has no way of connecting with the computer. And then, you know, you you go through the process of evaluating with them, all right, can we connect this? And then having them explore a way to connect it. And if it doesn't work, they, then having them reflect on why is it not working? What can we do? Do we need something else? And then even if there's a chance getting that something else, maybe buying it, maybe looking online for it. And if they can do that, that's that's a real life skill that they're developing. You know, that's the process that musicians go through. Something doesn't work. Okay, what do I need to make it work? Do I need to buy it? Okay, how much is it? You know, and that also brings them um the economics of it to the classroom where they go like, oh, this is expensive. Or, you know, maybe I can uh, save up to buy some of these. So, it, you know, it can provide different learning opportunities as well. Some of the difficulties when implementing effective objectives, like we mentioned, you know, students evaluating how it works or exploring something um, that we might emph be emphasizing, you know, the technical elements, or we might have like a rigorous lesson plan and might think that, you know, I'll just use five minutes to have students reflect. But what we found um, when doing research on this curricular unit is that that wasn't as easy to do. And if something that, that was almost impossible to do, it really requires a lot of uh, time to implement some of these objectives. And you have to treat it as your main activity almost, you know, or as one of two of your main activities. So it's about using your time efficiently. It comes down to really making sure you set the time apart for it and making it important because as great as it is that our students are creating and learning these skills and doing all these wonderful things, we also want them to reflect on what they're doing, uh, why they're doing it, what do they think about what they're doing. And having them go through that process, that thinking process is very, very important so that they kind of get the weight and the value of what they're doing. So it's not just so empty, right? It's not just about learning the skill, but learning the why behind it, their own why and their own personal reasons. And just going and practicing those different thinking processes that are very important for them especially even as they grow up and they keep going into middle school, high school, into adulthood, making them reflect on what they're doing. Yeah, and that's that's what's going to make the learning more profound because if it's just about some skills, like, okay, they can do it, but will they ever use that again? And through the reflection time is when they really make it their own. Remember we talked about, you know, reaching to that place where they value it. To get to that, they need time to think about it and to reflect and to know, okay, how do they feel about it? What does this mean to them? Each one of them might develop different reasons on why they want or do not want to do it. And that's important for them to be thinking about and to develop uh, effectively in that regard. Now, how to know how your music technology unit is going, you need to do uh, evaluation of the process. You need to judge your process, the students' work, and see the worth of it. And, you know, be mindful that as you go through through some of the procedures, things might not work out as you envision. Things might not uh, be perfect. And sometimes you need to change your course based on some of the evaluation that you do instead of just trying to do it regardless. And that's a way to be insensitive to students' needs. But we can only know that if we uh, evaluate at a more formal level a little bit. So one way to do it is the use of NAVMI standards. And we'll address, we'll explain a little bit more how we can use some of these and how we use some of these. But know that NAVMI has music technology standards available and they lay out um, criteria from proficient to advanced levels. And this can be very inspiring or it can be very resourceful to develop activities that might meet those standards and even to assess how your activities are meeting those standards. And we'll see because uh, one way to know that is by using rating scales. So by measuring that. 
we will uh, show you how uh, some of the handouts that we have might be used, but you know, we encourage you to develop your own as well so that you can rate the group's progress because it might be very difficult to keep track of your whole student population individually. But at least having a, me a measure of your group or, or of our group's achievement, or even in a day, as broad as that, will help you, will give you more information than just not having anything. Another way is by you doing your own reflection. As much as we talked about students doing the reflection and giving meaning to what they do, the same goes for us as, as educators, for us as teachers. If we start thinking about the practice that we do, where are we failing? What do we think should be improved? What we can do differently? Then we'll be able to adjust faster and to learn faster also on our own mistakes and our own successes. Will these things take some time? Absolutely, but they're so important. As far as the standards, we need to have a clear measuring stick of how we're measuring our students. So we need to be using those things. The measuring scales to know exactly how well are they uh, achieving those marks. So we have a proper way to evaluate them. And we have something that's quantified that we can reflect on to see how effective they're doing on meeting these different criteria. And then really the most important one is those pedagogical notes. Those pedagogical notes is where you're going to reflect on what's been going on, where you're gonna make some self-improvement. You're gonna recognize those classes that are struggling or maybe something's just not working for anybody. And this music technology could be snooze some for us. So we're gonna be making mistakes and that's okay. It's just learning from these mistakes and these pedagogical notes is where we get to do that. And we get to make our improvements, putting what happened throughout the day or throughout the week from our minds onto paper. So that when we're thinking about what we're gonna do for next week, we can look back and everything and see exactly you know, where we hit the mark, where we didn't hit the mark, what do we wanna keep doing and where do we wanna make our adjustments to keep setting up our students for success and creating that positive, environment where our students are, are going to want to keep creating and are going to keep wanting to be involved. So getting in that habit of reflecting daily, reflecting weekly, and then looking back on those reflections so you can plan out what it is that you how want to proceed for the next week. We also developed and we're going to show you an, an evaluation form for your right. lesson plan for each class where you have a space to not only rate, but also to write some observations that are particular to specific classes. And that goes beyond your uh, reflections for the day, but that will also help you spot some problems. So for example, we used a one to seven scale and we will show you in, in a moment, but if you get a class, you know, that's rating two, three, one on achievement, just from your general impression, Okay, then you can go back to what were your observations on that day, on that one, on those low ratings. And you might be see, you know, students um, were playing with each other or students were disengaged on this activity. And you might know, okay, then this activity, I need to change because they weren't having it. Or I need to change how I approach this activity because they weren't being engaged in this. But you will find the reasons why if you are more careful on taking some observations as well. So we will give some templates for an evaluation form that you can use on each lesson. All right, so here we're providing a sample curriculum that feel free to use and to replicate. Uh, of course, I imagine that if you, even if you try to replicate it as it is, it will require some adjustments based on the specifics of your situation. But we're providing here a general outline that might be helpful. So, you know, this is a 10 session curriculum that might fit a grading unit, a grading period. And we're providing a space for you to make your background explicit because this was it's, it's different from what ours was. Um, you know, some questions uh, to prompt you to think about the needs for you, for the students and some examples of the resource. It'll be good. It's good to lay out explicitly all the resources that you have so that you can work uh, based on that. Here's what we had. 
this is all that we had available on the music classroom especially what we ended up using was uh, the keyboards that had MIDI capabilities, um, the laptops. Uh, we used also headphones and the Tascam audio recorders. Of course, we used USB cables to connect all these and uh, software, which was Ableton, uh, but also we use Audacity. Uh, here are our goals, which are very uh, only three, but the very broad goals that might apply to multiple music situations. So if you remember when we talked about keeping the goals but changing the objectives, this is a little bit what we meant. Now, we chose uh, music standards uh, from the creating section uh, within music technology and one with the connect section. So here are the standards that we ended up using, but here's the link for you to see the full set of available standards on music technology. Here's how our curriculum looked like, what we ended up doing on each session. And here, it's a little bit of an explanation, which you can take a look. It will definitely take some time to study this curriculum if you wanted to implement it, and perhaps even more work if you want to alter alter it and make it fit your situation, but it can give you a good starting point. So here we have more detailed elements for each session. So this is almost like a, how the lesson plan would look, where we have you know the theme of the session, the standard that was used on that session, the materials uh, needed for that session, and we have outlined the objectives, the evaluation criteria for each objective, and the activities that will fulfill that criteria and that would that we thought would lead to those objectives. Now, for the evaluation forms, what we use is the evaluation criteria. So we will show you that on the evaluation instruments as well. And I'll just scroll down really quick so that you see that all 10 sessions are laid out here and available for you to use. Most of them are in table form, but some of them might be laid out uh, sequences. So this is something that is available for you and that feel free to use and to reach out to us, you will have our information at the end. So uh, if you need to reach out and contact us, you have any questions or you want to work um, on something, will be available for you as well. And you'll notice as well that the differentiated sessions that we talked about earlier in the presentation are here as well. So there's some that have the full, a full more challenging set, uh, lesson plan. And then there's one that same object, uh, same objectives, but different activities. So if you need to make those adjustments and at the same time, this is could just be just a jumpstart for you just to give you some ideas. You don't have to stick to it like Victor said, you can if you want, but most are often than not, your situation to be a little bit different than ours, or if not vastly different. So make adjustments where you need to and just have fun with it. Yeah, and uh, here we started on session seven to do differentiated lesson plans for different classes. So maybe four out of eight classes we're doing the regular lesson plan and another four we're doing the differentiated one as we started to know that it was necessary. So you see here, the main lesson plan has a little bit more components, has much more objectives uh, to meet. It's a little bit more detail on the technical side, while the differentiated one is a simplified version that just covers much less. But that remained, um, for example, in this case, uh, addressing the same standards. So you can see that we're keeping the general vision, um, but we're using slightly maybe different resources or just the objectives are simplified. So you can study this a little bit better. Same things happen on, gen on session eight and session nine. Now on the valuation here, we have an example from session eight. So you see there's a space for you to rate all uh, the standards and all the objectives as well and space for you to write comments. Now, the way we used it, we, we actually, you know, relied on paper, but and then you have to sort of transfer information. So if you want to do it 
uh, directly on online. If you have a computer and you can use and you can have a hand while you're teaching, uh, you can also just rate it. Usually the rating process happen after the teaching session because, you know, while you're teaching, you're so uh, focused on the work that you need to do that, you know, this probably takes about five to 10 minutes after your teaching session where you go, okay, you read the standard, okay, generally generate melodic, rhythmic, and harmonic ideas for compositions on improvis or improvisations using digital tools. And you ask yourself, you know, from one to seven, or you can do a one to five or a one to 10 scale, how much did they achieve? And this is a type of holistic evaluation score where it's just your general impression on the group's achievement. And so you might think, you know what, they were right at the middle. So, you know, they didn't, it wasn't as good, but it wasn't as bad. So I might just give them, um, I might just give them a four. And, and then you can write here why you gave them a four. And the same here for each of the objectives. So this is just one um, example, but there are, these evaluation forms are available for every session of the curriculum. Always try and do it when you finish your classes. Sometimes that's not possible. We have three or four classes in a row and you know we need to have time for ourselves to take our lunch, but always try and do it as soon as you can, day of, never try to wait till the next day. That way, you, everything that you, you remember, it's fresh in your mind and you can put it down and you can just be as accurate as possible. So when you're doing this reflections, they're very fruitful and they're very insightful. And it just comes back to just reflecting on what it is that we do every day. Yeah, um, we're providing also here um, an additional element to input all your information so that you can have a more comprehensive picture of what happened in the week or what happened in that session. So for example, uh, this is an example where you have um, this is related to session one of the curriculum. And so you have space here to write down all your uh, classes that might be doing that session. And in that case, there was only one standard and you can see here the ratings input. And what's happening here, this is remember on a one to seven, but this spreadsheet is already formatted for you to have um, values here. So what's helpful about this is that you can see some of the lower scores for example, in here, uh, we highlighted them in red. So we can go, okay, what happened here in these groups that achieved so low on this, you know? And if you see, this is what we were talking about, the effective objectives precisely, it was on the reflection part of the session that students weren't able to um, fulfill it. So, you know, that le led to a lower score on that. And that led us to, you know, try to, to improve that. And then you can also see on the total, okay, what class, you know, is the scoring lower? So you see these are probably some of the classes that ended up uh, going to the differentiated plans because the, the main ones were a little bit too difficult for those groups, right? But if you keep straining them, you know, it'll, you can lead, uh, lead them away. And what this helps you is to see this and you can see, okay, well, you know, this is not going that well for them. So maybe I don't need to keep pushing them in this same di direction, or maybe I didn't need to do something to improve these scores. And here you also have space to do your pedagogical reflection. So here we provide an example for you to, to see how this might look, but you know, um, you, know you, you might write down your thoughts, you know, things went smooth, uh, maybe better than you thought. Um, you know, students did it, the, the procedures fast. They didn't need that much help. Some uh, redirection was needed. Um, and then you might start thinking about, you know, maybe I need to adjust on, cert on certain things. So you see this, for example, uh, adjustments, need, I will make adjustments on the questions uh, to prompt the reflection because that's based on some low scores on reflection, right? And then, but then again, the next day, next day might not be um, as smooth and you might see, you know, things were a little bit more challenging and you can start exploring what are some of the reasons for that. So here's just some examples for you to see how this uh, might look in practice. And this might seem like a lot, 
but it's important because it lets us visualize and see everything across the board on who's excelling, who's having some difficulties. And also just so we have the numbers to back up what we're saying, right? A lot of us uh, music teachers, we have a lot of great ideas and things that work very well for us in the classroom. And we want to be able to prove why does it work so well and be able to quantify that. So when we're not just talking about it, we don't just have experience to say, experiences that say this is why it works. We also have actual data and numbers that show it is effective so that it adds more validity to what we're doing. Yeah, and we provide here one space to input based on every session of the curriculum we provided. You know, but then again, you can study this to make your own. Or if you wanted to implement the curriculum as we have it, these tables will suit that curriculum perfectly. So just some um, ways for you to, to use it and some additional resources in case you find them appropriate for your use. Thank you everyone for watching this session. If you want to contact us, Victor has his email right there. I have my email included in the slides as well, which you'll have available to you for download. And any questions that you have, maybe something that you think uh, we missed and you want clarification or you want to get another idea, please feel free, go ahead, email us here. We'll be more than happy to engage with you and answer these questions because this is something that is still ongoing, right? There's always new things to be discovered and there's, uh, and there's always new ideas to be implemented. So please, by any means, go ahead and email us here and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And once again, thank you for coming. We hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and have a wonderful day.